أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وصلى الله على سيدنا محمد الشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين الحمد لله على نعمة الإسلام وكفى بها نعمة اللهم علمنا ما ينفعنا وانفعنا بما علمتنا وزنا علما ورب زلنا علما الحمد لله الله سبحانه وتعالى sent the book of Allah to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and in a hadith uh, the Tirmidhi relates in a hadith the Tirmidhi relates Sayyidina Ali was with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said سَتَكُونُ فِتَنٌ كَقَطْعَ لَيْلَ الْمُظْلِمِ that there will, there will be tribulation like portions of a dark night and in a, another Transmission, he said, uh, بعض, بعض That one fitna will make the other one look very easy. And so Sayyidina Ali, رضي الله عنه وكرم الله وجهه, said, وما الخلاص يوم إذن يا رسول الله وما المخرج يوم إذن يا رسول الله What is the way out on that day? And the Prophet said, كتاب الله فيه نبأ ما قبلكم وخبر ما بعدكم ولحكم ما بينكم He said the book of Allah سبحانه وتعالى that that was the way out and he said in it is news of those who went before you and also of those who will come after you نبأ ما قبلكم وخبر ما بعدكم and the the way that it's uh, news of, of the people that will come after us is that the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala don't change. So every group mentioned in the Quran that are mentioned not for historical purposes but for ibra because the Quran is not a history book although it has history in it. Its function isn't to teach us history, its function is to teach us the sunnah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so that we can apply that sunnah uh, to any situation that we find ourselves in. Because situations uh, only change in terms of names, places, and people. But in terms of ahwal, or the states, they're, they never change. They're always the same. Vum is vum in whatever language, whatever country. Oppression is oppression. Fir'aun uh, is a historical figure, but it's also an archetypal embodiment of a, uh, of a behavioral pattern. Uh, which is oppressive by nature and so this is what the Quran is laying out and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us a book uh, within the book because in the Quran uh, Allah says that that he gave us this vast Quran but also these oft repeated or sab'a al-mathani the oft repeated dueled one or coupled verses and those are the verses of Surah Al-Fatiha so what I wanted to do was just look a little bit about at, at Fatiha and uh, just maybe look at it from a slightly different perspective than some of us have been used to looking at it. Al Fatiha is in the Arabic language called Ism Fa'il, and it has to do with action. It's not a, it's, it's translated sometimes as the opening, uh, but it actually is the opener. It, it's an active form. It's it, it's doing something. Al Fatiha is doing something. Fatiha yiftahu fahu fatihun. The Arabs would say, Al Fatiha is feminine because Surah is feminine, uh, so it's Surah Al Fatiha. And there's difference of opinion about whether it was a Meccan or a Medani uh, Surah. Uh, we know most of the uh, Meccan Surahs deal with Aqaid and things like that, and the uh, the Madani surahs tend to deal more with the Ahkam and things like that. But the Fatiha itself is a summation of the Qur'an, of the entire Qur'an. This is what it is in seven ayahs. And it's one of the uh, uh, characteristic mu'jizat uh, or those uh, disempowering elements of the Qur'an because the Qur'an uh, is a book that completely disempowered uh, creation to come with the likes of it. and the majority of the people of Balagha are of the opinion uh, that the incapacitating nature of the Qur'an 
is that it is not within human capacity to come with the likes of it linguistically or with its meanings either one and certainly not the two together the Mu'tazila uh, believe that it, it, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has just made it uh, uh, made the creation uh, incapable of doing it and uh, Zamakhshari and others actually considered that the eloquence it wasn't that it was uh, incomparable but that human beings were just unable to come with the likes of it but it's not uh, that's really a, a weak opinion so Al-Fatiha opens up the book and it tells us what the book is about and that's why it begins and there's difference of opinion again here at this point because Imam Shafi'i although everybody's in agreement that the, the surah has seven verses everybody because the Quran says that and the Prophet ﷺ said it in the hadith but the difference of opinion lies in whether the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim is a verse from the Quran uh, Imam Malik did not consider the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim from the Quran he considered that it was what they call falasal bin asur it was just something that was uh, uh, delimiting the, 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 the surah the themselves or uh, breaking them so that we know where they are and that's why in the, the riwayat of Nafi', which uh, is the riwayat of the people of Medina, they don't recite the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim when they move from one uh, surah to another. Uh, the other opinion, which is Imam Shafi'i's, is that it is a, it is a ayah from the Fatiha. And this is why Imam Shafi'i considers it wajib to read uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim in the, in the uh, prayer. And uh, Imam Matik actually considered it makru to read it. That's the, his, his opinion. Most of the people, the ulama from within his school, uh, consider it good to read the Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim for a principle in usul called, called mura'at al-khilaf where you, if you have a difference of opinion uh, about tahrim, then uh, the imams tend to say it's better to do that thing to get you out of the khilaf. That's why there's a story of an imam who used to uh, demand that he lead the prayer, which is unbecoming really of a scholar to want to be leading the prayer. Uh, and, uh, and some people asked him about that, why he always want, demanded that he be the one that lead the prayer. And he said that if he, if he prayed behind the Imam and he didn't read the Fatiha out of Abu Hanifa's school because Abu Hanifa says you shouldn't read the Fatiha behind the Imam whether it's a Sirri or a Jahari prayer. Yet he was worried that when he met them on Yawm Al-Qiyamah that Imam Shafi'i would give him a hard time because he didn't read the Fatiha. And he said, but if he read the Fatiha he was worried that his Imam, Abu Hanifa, would be upset with him that he left his. So he said, I worked out that the only way that I could please both of them is if I led the prayer, then I read the Fatiha in any case. And they're both agreed upon by that. So these are all uh, variances. But Imam uh, al-Shabi'i radiallahu considered it begins with Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim And the Bismillah ar-Rahman rahim is literally beginning with the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now, this is important in terms of the uh, one, the hadith that says, Kullu amrin di balin lam uh, yubda bi bismillah rahman rahim or bi bismillah or bi alhamdulillah. There's another riwayat, bi alhamdulillah. So, huwa abtar or ajdam or aqta'. There's different riwayat, but they all have the basic meaning that any action of any concern that doesn't begin with Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim has no, it's aqta, it has no barakah, that there's no good can come out of it. So the idea is that every action that the mu'min does, because all of his actions should be, you know, zubanan, should be worthy of being done, that he does it Bismillah, and that's why the Prophet ﷺ would say Bismillah constantly. His actions were in the name of Allah. And the first uh, revelation we all know, Iqra, and then Bismi Rabbika Alladhi Khalaq. So even the Iqra is in the name of Allah, the name of our Lord, the one who created. So the Quran begins then with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. 
It comes with Ism al Jalala, which is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Ism al Jalala is a name that indicates the essence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is not an attributive name. There is no attribute related to it. And the dominant opinion, the most powerful one, is that it is a proper name that has no ishtiqaq. Because we know most of you are Arabs, if not all of you, that in the Arabic language, names come out, they're d derivatives, and depending on whether you're a Kufan or a Basran in the grammatical schools, whether the Masdar is from the verb or from the uh, noun, uh, is going to uh, you know, change how, how you how you perceive that. But the point is, is that the name Allah, who some, especially the, the Mustashiriqeen, the Orientals like to say that Allah came from Al-Ilah. And there obviously you can see the Musharaka of Alif, Lam, Lam, Ha in Al-Ilah. And they'd say it was Idram, that you got the uh, annexation of the, uh, the, the uh, Lam, and then it becomes Allah. But that really... Uh, Oh, they can't hear? Yeah, maybe they should just... Uh, <laughs> you know, the Prophet وسلم, he had uh, people sitting... Um, this one? All right, I'll try to speak up. Where, where were we? Ism al Jalala. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is a name that really does not have ishtiqaq, a derivative. In some of them say the Qur'an itself is not uh, ishtiqaq, it doesn't, it's not derived out of. Some say it comes from Iqra, Imam Asyuti was of the opinion that it was like a Torah or Injil, that it was a proper name and did not, it wasn't a masdar of Qara'a. But Allah is unique in that that lamb is the only lamb of tafkhim in, in uh, the Arabic language. It's an emphatic lamb. You say Allah and you don't say Allah, which normally that's the way the Arabs would pronounce uh, a word with the lamb. But here they say Allah. And that tafkhim is in order to, uh, because of the, uh, what the, those tafkhim letters do, the emphatic letters, is that they, they uh, they give a grandiosity to the word. And so Allah, uh, then this, this beginning in the name of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now the, the, the name actually, Ismun, is interesting also. Because this is what Adam was given, is the, the ability of symbolic thought, which is what the essence of naming is. Naming is taking a symbol, which is linguistic, and applying it to something which is either material or empirical that we can feel, or it's abstract. Animals can't do that. Animals cannot use symbolic language. Human beings have, have basically three dominant modes of symbolic language. Uh, we have linguistic, which is the highest. And then we have mathematics, which is under linguistics, the, the tw 20th century or really the Western civilization is a civilization which has elevated mathematics over language. Language has taken a secondary place. And even one of the unfortunate uh, uh, travesties of our age is Muslims trying to prove that the Quran is a mathematical miracle, you see. I mean, this is something based on this feeling of inferiority uh, before the god of science, of modern science, which is mathematics. And this comes from Descartes and Newton and all these people that elevated mathematics as the only real way of knowing reality, because mathematics was precise and exact. Well, all those people didn't know Arabic, <laughs> because Arabic is exact and precise in a way that language can't come uh, close to. And this is why the mu'jiza of the Qur'an is a linguistic mu'jiza. The Prophet said in Sahih Muslim, نَحْنُ أُمَّةٌ أُمِّيَّةٌ لَا نَكْتُبُ وَلَا نَحْسِبُ We are an illiterate ummah that does not write, meaning the Arabs who الَّذِي بَعَثَ ذِي الْأُمِّيِّينَ رَسُولَ He sent from amongst the unlettered a messenger. He said, نَحْنُ لَا نَحْسِبُ وَلَا نَكْتُبُ We don't calculate and we don't uh, read. And for this reason, uh, the, the ulama traditionally did not like mathematical 
uh, formulas with the Quran. Because you can go insane looking at the abjadiya, right? Every letter in Arabic has Alif is one, Ba is two. You, every letter has a numerical equivalent. And there's whole ilm al huruf which some ulama got involved in. It's like uh, Jewish Kabbalistic uh, writings that uh, is really... Ibn Abbas, when he was asked about Surah... Inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr. He said... Um, that it's on this 27th night and somebody asked him how and he said because the letter hiya which Laylat al-Qadr is a feminine hiya is Bamir al-Mu'annath it's the feminine pronoun and hiya is the 27th letter in the uh, surah Al-Qurtubi says هذا من ملح العلم وليس من لب العلم this is salt that goes on knowledge and it's not real sound knowledge this is just like, it's interesting. But it's not something that uh, we should go d- delve deeply into. Harak al mutanati'un. So this whole number 19, and the proof of it is the man who started that whole thing literally went uh, completely crazy and lost his whole uh, balance and declared, he actually took ayahs out because they didn't fit into his computations and things like that. So the ism in Bismillah, that is in the name of Allah, right? And this is how it begins. Because we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the power of symbolic understanding. We cannot know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as we know things. We cannot know Allah as we know a tape recorder, if you're uh, somebody that knows uh, electrical engineering, or how we know uh, the world that we're in, what grass is, the texture, the color, the qualities, I mean, essences are hard to understand even with things. But with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the only way we can know Allah is through symbolic language. And this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forbade what are called timthal, tamathil. Ibrahim's question, he asked him, what are these tamathil? Ma hadihi tamathil? He asked him, what are these tamathil? Antum akifun alayha that you're assiduously uh, observing. Now, timthal in Arabic means to represent something else. In other words, the origin of idols is not that people worship the idol itself. The idol is only a concrete abstraction. It's a concrete symbol for something other than the idol itself. And this is the beginning of idolatry, is that people want to make something لِيُقَرِّبُونَ إِلَى اللَّهِ زُلْفَ Just something that will draw us near. This is what the Arabs call تَقْرِيب الْأَفْهَام and this is why Allah strikes Allah Mathalan. See, Mathal is a an analogical symbol for something we know to let us know something we don't know. If you can understand something that you already know, and then the person can explain to you how it's similar to this thing that you don't know, you say, ah, I've got it. It's like this. This is why Allah strikes him. But Laysa Kamithrihi Shay. And this is why the timthal is impossible for Allah. Allah has forbidden people to make analogies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but Allah allows linguistic analogy. In the Quran, Allah strikes many similitudes. وَلِلَّهِ الْمَثَلُ الْأَعْلَى Allah has the highest similitude. Allah is called Miliki Yawmiddin, the king of the day of judgment. Milik, we understand the concept of Milik because of human beings. لَيْسَ كَمِثْرِهِ شَيْءٍ وَهُوَ السَّمِيعُ الْعَلِيمُ أو السَّمِيعُ الْبَصِيرُ There is no thing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. No thing because a thing in itself is, comes out of non-existence. And Allah did not لَمْ يَلِدْ وَلَمْ يُولَدْ He did not come out of non-existence. A thing in itself comes out of non-existence. If you look at the word thing, شَيْء It's the masdar or the verbal noun of شَاءَ يَشَاءُ شَيْئًا in other words, Allah's Mashiach is what brought the Ashia into existence. And that is why Laysa Kamitrihi Shay. There is no thing like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the ayah is Kulu Shay in Harikun illa wajha. That illa is called istithna because it's different from al uh, istithna al muntata is different from istithna al muttasal in the Arabic language. In the English language you can't say that. If I say everything is perishing except the wajh of Allah, 
in English, we understand that the wedge is like it's a thing from amongst the thing. In the Arabic language, you have a certain type of istifna, exception, that is broken. It actually breaks. It's not from the jinns. Like Allah says that He commanded the angels to bow down to Adam. فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ Now we know Iblis kind of in a jinn. He was from the jinn. He wasn't from the angels. This is what they call an istifna al munqata. So this is why Allah says they all sajidun malaika jami'an. All of them bowed down. But illa Iblis didn't make sajda because we say qam al qawm illa al himar. The people got up except the donkey. The donkey is not from the people. But this is a type of uh, linguistic uh, uh, idiosyncrasy that the Arabic language has that other languages don't have. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not like anything. But yet Allah has has given us similitude in the Qur'an. So through the ism, and ism, if you look, the source root, samma yusammi, this is how we name. The root is the same root we get from the sama, from the sama. Because the sama, from the sama is where the power of symbolic uh, uh, articulation comes. Allah says, Ar-Rahman khalaq al-insan. علمه القرآن الرحمن علم القرآن خلق الإنسان علمه البيان. The merciful علم القرآن. He has put this Quran down as a alama, but also he taught it. It's an alama. It's a sign in itself. But also he taught it to the human being. خلق الإنسان. He created the human being out of nothing. That's what خلق means out of nothing. There was no thing. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the human being and then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Allah gave us the ability to articulate this is Allah Adam al-Asma He taught Adam the Asma the ability to differentiate because differentiation comes from Wahi from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or else we would just be like Baha'im who cannot differentiate except on a very crude materialistic level. But we have this ability to nusammi. But Allah has given us His name. Bismillah and then Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim we move into the attributes. How do we know Allah? We don't know Allah through His essence. Abu Bakr al-Siddiq radiallahu said, Al-Ajzu an idraakihi idraaku wal-khawdu fi kunhi al-ilahi ishraaku our inability to comprehend Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is our comprehension of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And our, our ignorance at speaking about the kun of Allah, the nature of Allah, is ishraq. That is association because whatever we say about Allah, it's incorrect. Anything that occurs to the, the human being's mind, Intellect, comprehension, Allah is other than that. This is why the Muslim stops. The names of Allah are called Tawqifiya in our Aqidah. We cannot give Allah a name that Allah has not given Him Himself. We cannot say that Allah is, for instance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is uh, whatever, cruel. We cannot say Allah is cruel, even if the human existential experience of Allah is that He's cruel. Because, Ana and Dawani Abdibi. I'm in the opinion of my slave. If the slave believes that Allah is cruel, then Allah will confirm that for him. He will, he will confirm that. In the ta'ir kum ma'akum, your ta'ir is with you. You see, the people, they were taken ta'ir, فَطَيَّرْنَا بِكُمْ We've taken a bad omen from you. Ta'ir kum ma'akum, your ta'ir is from you. This is just a projection from your own nafs. It's not reality. And so your ta'ir is with you. The same way, if Allah, if people perceive Allah, if they believe that Allah is cruel, like the Jews think that Allah uh, has done all these terrible things to them. You see? This is what they say. That's why they have ghadab upon them. Because they curse Allah. Ghullat, uh, Allah, they say His hand is tied. They, they say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is yid. They say that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, this, on and on. I don't want to get into what the Jews say, but... But the point is, is that we stop where Allah has stopped. We نُسْبِتْ مَا قَالَ اللَّهُ سُبْحَانَهُ وَتَعَالَى فِي نَفْسِهِ وَفِي أَفْعَالِهِ وَفِي صِفَاتِهِ وَنَقِفُ عَلَى ذَلِكِ 
على مراد الله نؤمن بها على مراد الله على صفاته وعلى كل شيء we stop where Allah has stopped we don't uh, go into uh, investigating the nature of Allah's essence the nature of his attributes so Allah tells us then Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim that the ar-Rahman is this this is his universal attribute of Rahma Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has all and this is important in terms of understanding Fatiha and inshallah I'll get to this that over Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's ghadab is his Rahma maktubun ala al-arsh sabaqat rahmati aw ghalabat rahmati ghadabi the rahma of Allah is over his anger now anger ghadab and inshallah I'll get to this anger is about justice and I, and I want to return to that theme when we get to ghayr al-maghdubi alayhim but Allah says now, if we want to understand the essence of Rahmah, of human Rahmah, where does Rahmah come from? The essence of human Rahmah is from the Rahm. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Rahm itself, the womb, and this is the archetypal womb from which all the wombs of, of women come from. Allah told this Rahm, قَدْ شَقَقْتُ قَدْ شَقَقْتُ إِسْمَكِ مِنْ إِسْمِ الرَّحْمَانِ فَمَنْ قَطَعَكِ قَدْ قَطَعْتُهُ I have taken your name, Rahm, and this is a proof, this hadith is a proof that the Arabic language is Tawqifiya also. Some of the ulama considered it was Mustalah Ali. It means that people just kind of agreed to call something a Ma'ida or a Khuan or a Minbar or to whatever. What the, the, the soundest belief is that the language itself is from Wahi. That these Allah has given this language. Inna anzalnahu Quran and Arabian la'alukum ta'akilun. Arabic has a unique uh, capacity in igniting the intellect by its nature because of ijaz, because of had, because of qatanab, all these different uh, elements of the Arabic language that are, 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 are uh, not found particularly in the European languages like English. I mean, Arabic, the Quran demands that you think, it doesn't let you off easily. The Quran makes you think by its nature, in Arabic. The thing you can't understand without deep contemplation. And the proof is, you just open up a Qur'an, a, 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 a tafsir, and then you start seeing, where did they get these meanings from? You see, because tafsirs don't end, they just keep going on and on. Because the nature of the Arabic language, the more you reflect on it, the more meanings arrive. You see, Al-Fatiha, I mean, just reflecting on Al-Fatiha, it just new meanings emerge out of these uh, seven ayahs. So Allah has made the Rahm the source of Rahma. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَأَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ This is one of the few times where Allah says, be conscious of Allah and something else. Allah mentions this only two times in the Quran that I know of. One is concerning the parents, anashkur li wali wali This is wa al musharaka, which is very rare for Allah to mention something with His name. Is that we thank Allah and we thank our parents. And then in this one, that we have conscious awareness of Allah and we have conscious awareness of the arham. The raham, if, if you see, if, if the insaniya is not nurtured in the house amongst our relatives, then there's no way it's going to be, uh, exist outside. You see, if we're all treating our own blood, our own flesh and blood, that have Sirat al-Rahm, and this is why it's one of the worst things in, in the Islamic tradition, Aql walidain, and then Qat al-Rahm. This is one of the worst things, it's min al-Kaba'ir. To do these things is from Mubiqat, to cut people off that have a blood bond with you. Why? Because if you don't learn how to live with these people, how can you live with the rest of people that don't have this bond with you, except that it's a distant bond with Adam alayhi salam? I mean, how is it, if we're not humanized in the house, then how can the society function? Where will Rahmah come from if it's not amongst our own flesh and blood? How can it extend out to the rest of the society? And so this is Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim, not Al-Ghabban, not Shadid Al-Iqab, not, it doesn't have these attributes, Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim. This is the first two essential attributes. Ar-Rahman is universal Rahman. Rahmati wasi'at kulla shay. Ar-Rahim is specific mercy. Wasa'aktubuha lalladhin yattaqun. And Allah specifically decrees it for those who have taqwa. Everybody has Allah's Rahman. The rain comes down, the kafir drinks, 
The Mormon drinks, the Asi drinks, the Fasiq drinks, the Wali drinks, the Alim drinks, everybody drinks. That's Allah's Rahmah. But the Rahmah of the Akhirah, Allah has written it and decreed it for the Muttaqeen. Kana bil Mu'minina Rahimah. He is Rahim bil Mu'mineen, not with the Kafirin. So he gives us the Rahman for everybody. And then the Rahim for those who believe in him. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. We have time to pray? Alhamdulillah. So then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala after Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim begins Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen Alhamd is the reason for our existence that we were created to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala this is the purpose of human existence ma khalaqtu al-insa wal jinna illa ma khalaqtu al-jinna wal insa illa liya'budun the only reason that Allah says, well, this is, there's four, some ulama say four, the isti'mar uh, in the earth for uh, civilizing the earth and for nusra, man yansur Allah wa rasuluhu, to see who gives victory to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to his messenger. And uh, here, uh, the fundamental purpose is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the way Allah is worshipped is through Alhamd and Alhamdu here is absolute all praise Alhamdu the Alif Lam here is, is for uh, istighraq all of praise Alhamdulillah so even the Hamd that we see an individual has if somebody is worthy of praise the Prophet is called Muhammad which is a passive form of that which is praise and he's also Ahmadu from the superlative form, Ism Taqdeel, Ahmadu. And he's also Hamid, Awwalu Hamidin, wa Muta'abidin. And he's also Mahmud. And Ahabu al Asma ilallahi ma humida wa ubida wa ma ubida wa humida. So the Hamd itself is Thana. It is to praise Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And even if the creation is praised, that it's praised only from that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has uh, manifested some attribute or characteristic in that, in that person worthy of praise. And that's why it always goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the Muslims, if they're amazed at something within an individual, they say subhanallah or mashaAllah or la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And these things protect from what's called al-ayn. Because the Prophet sallallahu said, al-ayn wa haqq. The ayn is true. It's in the Muwatta of Malik, it's a Sahih Hadith. That the evil eye is true. And so the evil eye comes from praising something or doing, and this is why Imam Malik had on the door of his house, MashaAllah, La Quwata illa billah, because he was a'jubat. He was an amazing human being, and he didn't want people going in there and being amazed at him and giving him the al ayn. So he put that on, make sure when they went into his house, they said, MashaAllah, La Quwata illa billah. And so the hand is what takes place on the tongue and in the heart. There is a sense of ijlal that comes from the heart or ikbar, where somebody uh, is inspired to praise. And then the hand moves up from the heart onto the tongue and is articulated. Shukr is a type of hand, but it is the hand of the jawarih. In other words, thankfulness. This is why we say Alhamdulillah wa shukru lillah. Alhamd is to Allah and shukr is to Allah. Shukr is when the hand moves to the limbs. In other words, it's not simply lip service, it's not on the tongue, it actually becomes manifest in the actions of the human being. And this is why, for instance, shukr, ni'mat al ayn, is ghabb al basar. That the, the ayn is a blessing, the eye itself is a blessing. And the shukr of the eye, the way that we praise Allah for the eye is to lower it from the maharam, to not look at the maharam, those things that Allah has prohibited. So the shukr of the eye is to lower it from the maharam. The shukr of the ear, the thankfulness or the gratitude of the ear is to not listen to the haram. The ghiba, the namima, the buhtan, these type of things. Allahu, alladhinahum 
Ani lahwi mu'aridun. Those are the mu'minun. Those who when they hear lahu, they just turn away. Wa idha khatabuhum al-jahiluna qalu salama. When ignorant people speak to them, they just say peace. We don't want to partake in this. I mean, this is the attribute of the mu'min. So this is an, a manifestation of shukr. That they go away from lahu, from vain talk, from vain speech, from these type of things. The shukr of the hand is to work, work them in the ibadah of Allah, in what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased with. Imam Shafi'i radiallahu anhu said, I learned two things from the people of Tasawwuf. He said one of them was, astaghfirullah, Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. He said one of them was, if my hands, إِذَا مَا شَغَلْتُ يَدَيَّ بِالْخَيْرِ شَغَلَتْنِي بِشَرَةٍ If I don't occupy my hands in good, they occupy me in evil. وَالْوَقْتُ سَيْفٌ إِذَا لَمْ تَقْطَعْ بِهِ قَطَعَكَ And the other was that time is a sword, if you don't cut with it, it cuts you. But the first one is that if the hands are occupied in good, they'll occupy you in evil. That's the nature. So shukr of the hands is to occupy them in good. And Allah will ask this about that. And the hands will bear witness. The eyes will bear witness. The ears, everything bears witness against the human being. إِنَّ الْإِنسَانَ عَلَى نَفْسِهِ بَصِيرًا وَلَوْ أَلْقَى مَعَذِيرًا The human being knows what he's up to. Even if he starts giving excuses. That's why the Arabs say, الْعُذْرُ أَقْبَحْ مِنَ الذنب. The excuse is uglier than the thing that was done wrong. Because we all have excuses. Life is just filled with excuses. And so, the shukr is the manifestation of hamd in the action. And this is why لا إله إلا الله the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم called it مفتاح الجنة the key to paradise but he said ولي كل مفتاح أسنان every key has teeth it's not just the key you have to have the locksmith fill in the teeth in order for it to fit the lock you can't just take a key a مفتاح and go try to open up something and the أسنان of لا إله إلا الله is acting according to it is acting according to it is entering into the da'ira of the people of لا إله إلا الله because it's a da'ira the leaving nifaq, leaving hypocrisy, all of these type of things. This is the shukr. So alhamdulillah to Allah, lillah. Now this, according to the majority of the ulama, is actually the highest praise there is. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. It's higher than la ilaha illallah. There is a hadith that says, and it's in the sahih, أَقْدَرُ قَوْلٍ مَا قَارُهُ النَّبِيُّونَ مِنْ قَبْرِ La ilaha illallah. The best thing that any pra'ana when Nabi Yunus min Qabri said is La ilaha illallah. That's the highest thing. But the, the, the way the ulama interpret that is to mean that because it contains tawheed. Rabbil al alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen also contains tawheed, but it also contains the position of the makhluk, of the marbuq. La ilaha illallah has no mention of makhluk, but the marbuq here is the creation. Rabbil alameen. Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah alone, Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all of the worlds. So now we move into another attribute. Again, Lillah, Alhamdulillah, like the first one, Bismillah, and then Ar Rahman, Ar Rahim, how do we know Allah? Here, Alhamdulillah, praise be to Allah, how do we know Allah? Rabbil Alameen, the Lord of all the worlds. Now, Rabb is an interesting word that has different derivations according to the ulama. But many of them say it comes from the word Rabba Yurabbi, Tarbiyatan, Murabbi, the one who nurtures, the sustainer, the one who causes things to grow. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this is the tarbiyah of Allah. Like one of the poets, he said, Ghadaytani fil hasha janina, u kunta li qabla waridaya. Ghadaytani fil hasha janina. You nurtured me in my womb. U kunta li qabla waridaya. Allah is the first of, the, of those who Yurabbiq. And the last, who will will akhiru. The parent is an interim murabbi, the mother and the father. That's why shukr goes to them, because they're in a place of, of uh, tarbiyah and ruhviya over you. We call the mother rabbatul manzil, and the father is rabbul manzil. This is why in the surah, uh, in the Quran, qul a'udhu bi rabbin nas. Miliki nas, ilahi nas. Allah begins with Rabb nas because everybody, anybody can be a Rabb. We're all Rabb. You see, if you live in a house and you have people, you're a Rabb al Manzil. Anybody can be a Rabb. But then Allah goes the next step. Miliki nas, the king of humanity, the Rabb of humanity, but many of you are Rabb. The king of humanity, only a few are kings. 
But then, ilahi nas. That's the wahdiniya. That's the fardiya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That He is the unique and only God of humankind. There is no other God. La ilaha illa Allah. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Al alameen. Al alam is the uh, ism al maf'ul lil alim. Alim is what, who, the one who knows. The one who knows. This the alim is the one who knows. And you can know many things. A human being can be alim of one thing and jahil of another thing. Allah is alim with absolute knowledge of everything. The human being knows Allah through the alam. The, the alam is the indication of the alim. And this is the way the Muslims have always understood. We believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of the overwhelming proofs. Wujuduhu, like Ibn Ashir says, Wujuduhu lahu dalilun qati' Hajatu kulli muhdathin li sani' Lo hadathat li nafsiha al-akwanu Lishtama'a tasawi wa rujhanu That this existence has an absolute proof of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's existence. That every created thing needs a creator. Muhdath. Kullu muhdath. بحاجة إلى محدث كل عالم بحاجة إلى عالم or else it can't be عالم nothing can exist in a passive state nothing can exist in a passive state and therefore the world and how we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that He exists is through the athar تلك الاثار تدل علينا فانظروا بعدنا إلى الاثار like the Bedouin Imam Shafi'i as he lived with the Bedouin 17 years with Bani Tamim, studying the Arabic language, Imam Shafi'i. This is what Ikhlas, living with the Bedouin, eating the Bedouin food for 17 years in order to master the Arabic language in the Bedou of Najd. And this uh, Bedouin, he asked him, كيف عرفت ربك? And he said, البعرة تدل على البعير والروثة تدل على الحمير والأثار تدل على المسير فسماء ذات أبراج وأرض ذات فجاج this Bedouin, he said, the, the camel dung tells me there was a camel there. The donkey dung tells me there was a donkey there. Footsteps in the, in the sand tell me that there were people walking by or something walking by. He said, so if I look at this sky with all of these perfect constellations and the earth with all of these valleys and trevices and places to traverse, and this ocean with all of these waves, doesn't this indicate the Latif, the Khabir? This is Istidlal. This is how this simple human being understood that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala existed. And many, the, it's only very uh, arrogant people, Yahadu biha. You see, they, they, they reject it. But they their own selves know the truth of it. You see, Fir'aun knew that, that, that he wasn't an ilah. In, in one of the commentaries, uh, teacher, Sheikh Murad Tahaj, who I studied with in Mauritania, he said that uh, Fir'aun didn't like the fact he had to go to the toilet because it wasn't befitting. He said, Ana Rabbukum al-A'la, I'm your Lord the Most High. And so he brought his physicians together and said, how can I get out of this? I have got the... And they said, eat the moles, bananas. <laughs> so they said he ate bananas for 40 days and then... He had a big problem. <laughs> <laughs> so the human being gets arrogant. The atheist becomes arrogant. Atheism is a type of arrogance because they're rejecting something that is the most obvious and fundamental aspect of their existence, that they were created. I cannot say I wasn't created. Now if I say, well, my father created me and, and his father before him created him and his father before that's what they call devil. You see, it just tessels it. It just keeps going back. And where do you stop? Now they admit there was a first man. They're calling him Adam. Recently they published in the scientific journal. They realized there was a first man. Well, we, this is old news for us. <laughs> Welcome to the, the new world order. You know, this is old news for the Muslim. And then before that they said there was a first woman. Well, we knew that as well. Because it doesn't take much intellect to realize exponential growth factor that they all, then their statistics love to talk about this growing population. Where did it all start? with two human beings. That's it. That's where it all came from. Kullukum and Adam. Wa Adam and Torah. 
All of you are from Adam, and Adam is from Torah. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Lord of all the world, and these worlds are the indications of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how we know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is the blessing the intellect was given to the human being to identify his Lord. But we need the wahi in order to get us on the right path. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. This is the first thing, to know your maqam in the world, your station in the world, to know who you are. You are marvu, you are created, you will die, you will be raised up. This is the maqam of knowing that you are marvu, and this is the maqam of the abd, of knowing that you are not ma'bud. But Fir'aun wants to be ma'bud. There are people out there, they want to be worshipped. They want people to kiss their hand. They want the people to grovel at their feet. And these are the people that Allah tells them that you are min sulalat and min teen. You are just from some uh, chain of, of dirt, of mud and water mixed together. Min ma'in maheen, from a vile fluid you came out. Min ma'in dazaq. Who do you think you are? Allah tells these people, get down off your high horse. Be a rajal. Rajal is the one, rajala an farisihi. He comes down off his high horse and gets to the earth, puts his feet on the ground, doesn't get raised up above the earth where he came from, from the dust that he came from. That's a rajah. And all these other people just playing games, trying to be ilah, trying to be ilah. And Allah says, no, be a rajah, be a Bani Adam, be Adami. Don't be, think that you are God, think that. So this is accepting the maqam of Rabb al-Alameen. Once you realize Rabb al-Alameen, الَّذِينِ يَتَفَكَّرُونَ فِي خَلْقِ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضِ وَاخْتِلَافِ اللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ They reflect on the creation of the heavens and the earth, and the, cre- and the changing of the night and the day. When they do this, then they realize, by يَذْكُرُونَ اللَّهَ قِيَامًا وَخَوْدًا وَعَلَى جُنُوبِهِمْ وَيَتَفَكَّرُونَ Where's all the, where's the President Bush, where's uh, Gorbachev, or whoever they were, the kings of this world, where are you now? Where's your power? Where's the Red Army to save you? Where's the F-16? Where's the Marines that are going to come in and make everything better? Who's the king today? This is the question that Allah asks. Who's the king? No answer comes back because Allah is an al-milik. Allah is miliki yawm al-deen. And then the Yom al-Din is the day of Dain, the day of death, the day of death, Allah is Dayan. This is called Deen. This is our transaction with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. كَيْفَ مَا تُدِينُ تُدَانُ How you transact with others, so will you be transacted. اِرْحَمْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ اِرْحَمْ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ يَرْحَمَكْ مَنْ فِي السَّمَاءِ have mercy with people on the earth and Allah will have mercy in the heaven. How you treat other people, Allah will treat you. That's why there's one man on the Yom Al-Qiyamah. The only thing he ever did, he used to lend people money. That was what he did. He was like a money lender. And those people usually generally kind of bad people, black-hearted people. But when his servant, he would send him out and tell him uh, to go collect the money, he would find the man has dua isra, he is having a hard time the servant would come back and he'd say, forget about it. So on Yom Qiyam, this man comes, he doesn't have any hasana, except that he used to do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, will I leave him to be more generous than me? You see? He used to forgive people and now I'm not going to forgive him. And this is to teach us about the nature of Muhammad, which is what we're going to get to at the end of this surah. Miriki yawmi deen. The day the debts fall due, the day of judgment. Yawm al-hisab is another word for it. Because that is the accounting, the reckoning. The Prophet said, Hasibu qabla an tuhasabu. One of them said, Walib ala wa walib ala al-fikr al-mu'ini ala al-jiddi wa sari' ila al-a'mali fir'umru yadhabu. Do much reflection about the, 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 what's going to help you be serious in this world. And hurry to action because your life dissipates, it goes. وَفَكِّرْ فِي أَحْوَلَ الْقِيَامَةِ دَائِمًا كَبَعْثٍ وَنَشْرٍ وَالْمَوَازِينِ تُنْصَبُ And think about this Yawm Al-Qiyamah. Think about it all the time. The Prophet وسلم, said, think about now. أَكْثِرُ مِنْ ذِكْرِ هَذَا مِنْ لَدَّاتِ Do much remembrance of the, of the destroyer of delights, the destroyer of pleasure which is death. 
The Prophet ﷺ said, اِدُّوا أَصْحَابُ أَنفُسُكُمْ مِنْ أَصْحَابِ الْقُبُورِ Consider yourselves already in the grave. Be ready now for your death. Because it comes فَجَأَةً It comes without any warning. The angel comes and takes the soul. وَالنَّزَعْتِ الْكُبْرَى Rips it out. And this is the reality of life. And so the Prophet ﷺ told us to do these things. And he says, this poet says, reflect on the ba'ad. We're going to be raised up. On the nashar, we'll be gathered together by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Wal mawazin tunsabu. And these balances that will be set up, the hasanat that will be weighed, the sayyat that will be weighed, atadrun man al muflis, al muflis man la dinar wa la dirham indana ya rasulullah. The one who has nothing is the one who has no dinar and dirham with that. The Prophet said, al muflisu min ummati man ata yawm al qiyam bi hasanatihi. فَقَدْ شَتَمَ هَذَا وَضَرَبَ هَذَا وَقَطَعَ هَذَا The one he comes with his hasanat on Yawm Qiyamah, he hits this one, he cheated this one, he lied to this one, he struck this one, he backbited against this one, all these type of things. فَتُؤْخَذُ مِنْ حَسَنَاتِهِ His hasanat are taken and given to those people that he was doing things bad to. And then when he has no more hasanat, he has to take their sayyat. This is because it's Yawm al-Deen. It's the day when the deaths fall due. It's Yawm al-Hisab. And so this is a recognition, a deep recognition. Once you realize this, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُ I'm only going to worship you. If I have to stand before you on Yawm al-Qiyam, يَوْمِ يَقُمُ النَّاسُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ One of the, uh, Ibn Uyayna, Allah Alam, uh, one of the early salaf, uh, one of the Amirs came into the Masjid of the Prophet and everybody got up except Ibn Uyayna. I think it's him, Allah Alam. And somebody asked him, why don't you get up? Because uh, Qiyam al Kiram and all these, there's fatwas about this. Even uh, Imam al Nawi has a fatwa about uh, getting up uh, for people. But the point is, he said, I was about to, and then I remembered Allah saying, Yawm yaqumun nasi The day that we have to get up before the Lord of all the world. Who is this one? Like Suhban ibn Wa'il, he was called Khatib al-Arab, one of the most eloquent of the Arabs. They have a mithal, they say, Afsahu min Suhban, that's how eloquent he was. And he was in the presence of uh, Muawiyah, and, and the, Muawiyah asked him to give a talk. And he said, uh, bring me a stick, a staff. And the Hajj, the Chamberlain, said, What do you need with Asa in front of the Amir al Mu'mineen? And he said, What does Musa need Asa in front of the Lord of the world? So, this is an analogy, a metaphor, that people, they go in presence of the king, they have Heba. You see, kings have Heba. If you've ever been, to a majlis, and I hope you never have to, but if you've ever been to a majlis of an Amir or one of these things, like I was in Qatar and went into the majlis, and same in uh, Abu Dhabi, and these are like uh, Umayrun, I mean they're not real Amir, they're like little Amir. But uh, you go in there and you see people really nervous, hearts beating, people really ready to jump. Why? Heba. They have Heba. When late. Uh, Yahya ibn Yahya al Layth al He relates the Muwatta of Imam Malik. He met Abdurrahman al Dakhal. Abdurrahman al Dakhal was a great uh, Amir. He's called Saqr al Quraysh. And he had, uh, he, he fled from the Bani Abbasiyah when they took over. He went to uh, Andrusiya and he starts a new Khilaf of Bani Umayyah. But he ha his masjid was very full of Heba. And he was a righteous man. When, when Christians used to visit, he had a special way. Uh, one of the Christian ambassadors who wrote his chronicles about this visited him. There were 100 uh, soldiers with their swords over he had to walk under. And then when he got there, he came to the, the palace and he kept going through the halid, these small chambers, until finally he got to a big room. And then they went out of that room, outside, and there was a small little uh, hut. And then he went into this hut. And there was a man there sitting on the ground and he had the Qur'an, he had a fire and he had a sword. And it was an empty room. 
And he came and he said, tell him through the translator, he said, tell him, this is the Amir al-Muslimin, this is the Amir of the Muslim. He said, tell him that we have a simple method. We call people to this book. If they don't want to follow the book, then we tell them that they pay as jizya and we protect them. If they don't want our protection, then we take this up and we fight them. And he pointed to the sword. He said, if we fight them with this, they have a big problem if they die because they enter that and he pointed to the fire. And that was Abdul Rahman. <laughs> very simple, very clear. Yahya ibn Yahya said, when I went into the majlis of, of Abdul Rahman al dakhil ma hibtu ahadan kama hibati lahu. He said, I never felt so much hayba. And this is something Allah gives people. Not just kings, some ulama have a hayba like this. People get afraid of them. He said, when I visited Medina and went into Marik's majlis, he said, Wallahi astasgartu majlis Abd Rahman al-Dakhal anda Marik radiallahu anhu. That he said, I bin, I, the majlis of Abd Rahman al-Dakhal became little in my eyes, insignificant when I saw Malik. That was the hayba of the ulama, that's why Imam Malik called Amir al-Mu'mineen for hadith And this was the hayba of Islam, Izzat al-Islam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then, Iyaka na'abudu, to you alone we worship. To you alone we worship. This ibadah is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone. And this is what frees the human being. Ya ibn Adam, the hadith al-Qudsi says, Ya ibn Adam, tafarraq li ibadati, amla sadraka ghinan wa asudda faqra. Occupy yourself with my ibadah, with my worship, and I will fill your breast with wealth, and I will take care of your poverty. And another hadith says, Man ja'ala humumuhu hamman wahidan, kafallahu lahu sa'ir al humum. The one that makes his anxieties one anxiety of meeting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah takes care of his worldly anxieties. So this state of ijaka na'abudu, this is the maqam of the one who is fearing the day that he has to stand before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Lord of all the world. The one who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is his Lord, that is the one that everything is his uh, servant. And the one who is the servant of dunya, then everything becomes his Lord. This is the paradox of creation. If you take Allah as a Rabb, then everything becomes uh, Abd for you. But if you take everything as a Rabb, any created thing as a rub, you become the slave of everything. And this is the worst type of existence. The one who has fear of Allah doesn't have fear of creation. They don't fear their provision. They don't fear uh, the king, the muluk, any of these type of things. So, إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Then the isti'ana is to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Not just the worship, but the isti'ana. And this is again the tawheed of Allah. We seek refuge in Allah. We seek Allah's awn. We seek the help from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This does not negate al-akhdu bil asbab. The Prophet sallallahu he took shura from his people. He built the khandaq. He did all of these things. These are asbab. But the difference of the one who has isti'ana with Allah, his hope is not in the asbab, it's in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He takes the asbab, the means, the causes, but he doesn't place his thiqah in the asbab, he places his thiqah in the musabdib, who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one who causes things to happen. And this is why, Allah can prevent them from fighting you even if they have power. You see, Allah can get Bosnians, he can have the Serbs start fighting the Croatians, and uh, Allah can do whatever He wants. So the isti'ana is with Allah and with nothing other than Allah. إِيَّاكَ نَعْبُدُوا وَإِيَّاكَ نَسْتَعِينَ Once this is sound, then we need how then do we worship Allah and how do we seek His own? إِهْدِينَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ Guide us on the sirat al-mustaqim, which is the middle way. كَذَلِكَ دِعَنَّاكُمْ أُمَّةً وَسَطَى We have made you a middle ummah. Now the middle ummah is between two things. Like Sayyidina Ali said, al khayru bayna sharrain. Good is between two evils. al ifrat wa tafriq. Too much and too little. And this is where the majority of Muslims fall into. They're either doing too much, which in these days is very few, what they call ghulu fid-deen, the people that go to the extreme in the deen, لَنْ يَشَدَّ هَذَا الدِّينَ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا غَلَبًا فَيَسِّرُوا وَلَا تُعَسِّرُوا No one will try to take on this whole deen all the aspects of it, except that he'll be wiped out. It'll overwhelm him. 
So just make it easy for people and don't make it difficult for people. And that's the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. He was muyassir and he wasn't muassir for people. He did not make things hard for people. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says then, اِهْدِنَ الصِّرَاطَ الْمُسْتَقِيمِ This middle path, this sirat al-mustaqeem, it's based on istiqama. The Prophet ﷺ was asked a man, he said, give me some counsel. He said, قُلْ آمَنْتُ بِاللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقِمْ الَّذِينِ يَقُولُونَ رَبُّنَ اللَّهِ ثُمَّ اسْتَقَامُ Those who say our Lord is Allah and then they are upright. They're people of the sirat al-mustaqeem. So those are the people who have success in the next world. And this istiqama is based on two things. It revolves around two fundamental elements in the deen of Islam. Salat and zakat. All of istiqama revolves around salat and zakat. If you're doing salat properly, and, and I emphasize properly, inna salat tanha an al wal munkar. Salat by its nature prevents people from doing bad things. So istiqama is foundational in the prayer that it's being done right. One man, they came to the problem and he said, so and so prays at night and then he cheats in the daytime. He said, satan hal. The prayer in the night will prevent him. If he keeps doing it, it's going to prevent him or he'll leave the prayer. But the two don't go together. But this is real prayer. This isn't mechanical, automatic, robotic prayer. If the prayer was just with the body, then we can get uh, GM or something to make uh, not just Adhan clocks, but like prayer, prayer robots that you can time them. You can even give the whole time for the same every like computer program and then they just go through the mechanical motions. If that's all prayer was, then who needs uh, prayer? If it's just these mechanical motions. The prayer has to have a ruah. It has to have a spirit. So this and then the, the zakat, your individual responsibility with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the purification of yourself. The essence of purification of the self is in prayer, a tazkiyah. And then you move to the purification of the society which is embodied in zakat. So this is ihdina sirat al-mustaqim. Then Allah goes into a beautiful exposition of the two ways human beings go astray. غير المخضوب عليهم سرات الذين أنعمت عليهم من النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين. That is the one of the prophets and the righteous and the martyrs and those truthful ones. Then Allah said, غير المخضوب عليهم رضاعين. The غير المخضوب عليهم. This is من جانب الإفراط. These people go to an excess in their pickiness and they're embodied archetypally in the Jewish rabbinical syndrome. The rabbi is the one who just condemns everybody else. You see, this is the rabbi, he learns all the laws so that he can find fault in everybody's uh, deen. You see, and Ibn Taymiyyah, rahimahullah, said that our, our people go astray two ways. The people of Islam go astray two ways. Like the Jews, who are the fuqaha, who don't practice what they preach. That's the one way, that's like the rabbi. The faqih, who's telling everybody what to do, and he doesn't do anything. And that's having knowledge and not acting on it. And then the other one is the abid. The ignorant worshiper, which is embodied in the archetype of the Christian, waladbalim. So the first one is the faqih, غير المغضوب عليهم, or the rabbi, or whoever. You see, it's, it's the scholastic element in the human being that wants to learn all the rules so that they can tyrannize other people with them. You see, now learning rules is fundamental. The, the reason that they do this is that they want, uh, if you ask them, why do you want people to follow the rules? So they say, so there's justice. Because the essence of law is the establishment of justice. The essence of justice is ghadab. You cannot have justice established without ghadab. This is why they're maghdub alayhim. You see what the, what the Jewish syndrome in, in uh, history, if you read their own book, because they've recorded their own, they're always complaining about everybody else. You see the, the Germans tyrannize them, these people tyrannize, the Arabs tyrannize them, the, the Europeans, everybody, is always everybody else. They never look at themselves. Maybe there's a reason why people don't like you. 
I mean, when the whole world gets it, see, they think that this thing, what they call anti-Semitism, is some irrational thing in the human being. Like, human beings are just created anti-Semitic. I mean, logic necessitates that we reject that idea, you know. I mean, human beings aren't that. We have many irrational aspects, but I don't certainly don't think that uh, this idea that we're somehow human beings are don't like Jewish people is not, uh, it's just not feasible. So they're asked by Allah to look at themselves. If you don't want to look at yourself, but you want to condemn and curse everybody else, this brings on the wrath of Allah. You return with a anger from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because you're condemning everybody else and you're not rectifying your own self. This is the Jewish archetype. And I'm not saying that all Jewish people fit into this or there's, you know, I mean, I'm reading a book now by this man, Ishaq Israel, which I would recommend to anybody called Jewish History, Jewish Religion. This is a man of very high moral conscientiousness. And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi praised uh, Jewish, some Jewish people at his time. And we know that some of the rabbis became Muslim and admitted the truth of Islam. But some of them didn't. One of them fought uh, in the battle of Uhud and the Prophet said, Huwa khayruhum. Because the rest of them, they didn't go out. Allah says in the Quran that some of them, that they will give if you entrust them with a trust of a, of a tentar, of money or something, that you adhi like, you know, you can trust them, that he'll give it back to you. And other ones, you have to be right there with them all the time. Well, there's a lot of Muslims like that. I mean, that's not, the, the, the Jews don't have a monopoly on that. I mean, there's people that do. So the point is not to say, you know, this blanket statement. And what we're talking about is archetype. That's what we want to understand here, is that this is embodied in the Jewish archetype. And the Muslim can certainly be like that. That's why we, the Prophet said, Antum ashbahu ummatim bi Bani Israel. You are the most like Bani Israel of all the ummah. That's a hadith sahih. We're the most like Bani Israel. And he said that تَتْبِعَنَّهُمْ حَدْوَ النَّعْلِ بِالنَّعْلِ حَتَّى لَوْ كَانَ مِنْهُمْ مَنْ أَتَى أُمَّهُ عَلَنِيَ لَكَانَ مِنْ أُمَّةِ مَنْ صَنَعَ ذَلِكَ أُوْ كَمَا قَالَ Even if one of them, you will follow them to such a degree, if one of them, he has some uh, 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 physical relation with his mother, that there would be somebody from my ummah imitate him just to be like that. I mean, so he, he's telling them, don't condemn them if you're like them. What superiority do you have if you're behaving just like them and saying, oh, well, they're Jew and I'm a Muslim? No, that's not justice. That's not justice. Our superiority is in behavior. And if we're the same in ma'asiyah, ghalabuna, like Omar said, إِذَا اسْتَلَيْنَ فِي الْمَعَصِيَّةِ huh? Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives victory over of our enemies over us. Because our fadl is not in uh, worldly things. It's in otherworldly things, it's in our istiqama. So this embodiment of this element is about ghadab. Now, if you look at Umar ibn al-Khattab, Umar ibn al-Khattab for the Muslims, we would say if you want to think of those two things that really symbolize Umar, we would say ghadab and adal. Umar is known for his ghadab, he gets angry easily. And so many stories in the tradition where Umar is getting angry. But he's also known for Adam. Because that, you, you will not establish justice if you don't have indignation, if you don't get angry. You see, if you just sit around and say, you know, ma'alaysh basita, doesn't really matter, no big deal. Who, what, who's going to get up and change the, the situation? But the one that says, astaghfirullah, then you can't do that. You can't just steal that from him. You can't cheat like that. You can't. That, you get angry. And that anger becomes ba'ad. That's why the moment يَغْضَبُ لِلَّهِ He becomes angry for Allah. And that's why Allah has two characteristic attributes that are written on His throne. الرَّحْمَةِ and غَضَبْ Because the غَضَبْ is about justice. That Allah wants to rectify and make things right. And that's what Yawm al-Din is about. Where justice is established from the غَضَبْ of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But Allah reminds us, if He's going to get angry at them, do you think He's not going to get angry at you? Do you think that you're so perfect, that you're so outside of this uh, situation or behavioral patterns that you won't also incur the wrath of Allah? So this is the danger of entering into this maqam of maghdubi alayhim. 
is that once you begin to criticize everybody else and forget your own self, you incur the wrath of Allah. Even if all of your criticisms are right, if everything you criticize is correct, you can be absolutely perfect in your criticism. But if you're not looking at yourself, then what benefit of it is? Then the next thing, what about me? Now this is the other way that people go astray, which is embodied archetypally in the Christian. According to the hadith, the maghdub alayhim are the Jew and those who follow them in their way and their behavior and the ba'alin are the Christian. The ba'alin are people like the abid. They're people who don't have, a, they don't have knowledge, but yet they act, they do whatever they want. The Prophet sallallahu said, فَقِيهٌ وَاحِدٌ أَشَدُّ عَلَى الشَّيْطَانِ مِنْ أَلْفِ عَابِدٌ One faqih is worse and more harsh with shaitan than a thousand worshippers. Because the worshipper, you can lead him astray. That's why he's ba'alim. Now what is the essence of Christian religion? What is the essence of it? I mean, tell me somebody. What do they say anyway on their tongue? No, 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 not from an ideological perspective, from the experience of Christian religion. <laughs> you know, I would say that it's love. You see, well, I mean, you agree with that? This is what the Christians talk about. Love. Love everybody. Forgive. I mean, they never do it, but they talk about it all the time. <laughs> love everybody. Forgive. Turn the other cheek. Love your enemy even, you see. Now if you look at the word Baal, Baal in the Arabic language, one of the meanings is to love excessively. You see, like in the Quran it says, وَوَجَدَكَ ضَالًا فَهَدَى One of the interpretations, loving Allah, and so Allah guided you. Loving Allah without knowing how to worship Allah, so Allah guided you. So the Baalin are like the Abid who loves Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so much, but he doesn't know how to worship Allah. He's just doing it from his own, you see. And this is what the, the embodiment of the Christian. Now they can say anything they want because they don't even have uh, uh, academia anymore in the Christian religion. They can get up and say, you know, paradise is an 18 hole golf course and whatever they want. And nobody's going to argue and nobody, you can't say that. <laughs> where, where does it say it in the Bible? But you can hear ministers saying things like that. You know, he's probably on the 18th hole right now with the Archangel Jibreel. I mean, they say stuff like that. Why? Because they're Baalim. They don't have any rawadah. They have no qiyud. They have no qawaid. They have nothing that they base the religion on. This is Baalim. Now, if you look at the Muslims of how they go astray, our tendency is to go astray like the Jew. Maghdubi alayhim. Not like the Baalim. The embodiment of it is, I would say, in this, uh, this uh, dialectic between two fundamental elements within the Islamic historical tradition. The one element is the Sufiya, or the Mutasawwifa, who tend to move towards love. You see, their, their teaching is about love, mahabba, you have to love Allah. Their emphasis is on raja, not on khawf. And then the other element, is the fuqaha, whose emphasis is on khawf. They want to warn people. They want to get people to fear Allah. The sufiya want to get people to love Allah. The fuqaha, they want people to get fear Allah. So they act according to sharia. If you love Allah too much, you'll be get lax in the sharia. Because you love Allah so much, how can Allah punish me? I love Allah so much. This is what the Christian thinks. Allah will never punish him. So this is the tendency of the, of the sufiya to move toward that extreme, and many of them have went off the deep end. Uh, uh, Ahmed Zarruq, one of the great Sufis, and a great faqih as well, he's called the Muhtasib uh, al-Ulama wal-Awliya. That's his laqab with the, with the ulama. The one who's, you know, the quality assurance of the ulama and the awliya. He's taking care of both sides because he was a, a Sufi, but he was also faqih. And he used to say, don't be Sufi and faqih, be faqih and Sufi. You know that the emphasis should be on the, the sharia to protect you so you don't go astray. And he said, أَكْثَرُ سَارِكِي هَذِهِ الطَّرِيقَةِ هَالِكُونَ The majority of people that take the path of tasawwuf, they end up getting destroyed. Because they go astray like the abid. They get too much. They get lost. You see, and then they say outrageous things. 
They do because it's from balala, it's from this intense love. So you have some of them saying the most outrageous things called shatahat. And then you have the faqih over on the other end trying to pull him over. They're both at extreme. The middle way of the Prophet ﷺ, you see. The middle way is that the deen is not dry scholastic book learning. That was not the way of the Sahaba. They were not scholars of books. They were men that many of them only knew a little bit, but they practiced it, they implemented it, and they took it out to the people. Take even one verse of the Qur'an and teach it to people. This was the way of the Sahaba. So the alim who distances himself with his books, and he forgets the people, and many of the ulama, this became their characteristic trait. They couldn't even sit with people because they can't bother themselves with their petty questions and their stupidity and their inability to understand the subtleties of ma'ani and badi' and al-arud and all these wonderful things that they spent their life studying. You see? And so they lose touch. And this is why within the ummah there have been two groups of people. One group from the fuqaha and one group from the sufiya that they join in this middle way and they make rectification. They become people of sirat al mustaqim And these people are like Imam al-Nawawi, radiallahu anhu, who was a, a alim of the people, but he was also a man of, of ruhaniyyah. He was a man of deep spiritual, intense spiritual awareness. And this man, he wrote books for the masses of people. Not like many ulama who only wrote books for a very small select group of people. He wrote books for that today are read in every masjid in the world. I mean, look at this man. Who was uh, uh, Yahya al-Nawawi, radiallahu anhu. I mean, who was that man who died at the age of 43? And look what he left behind. He left behind books that every, every righteous Muslim has his books in his house. Al-Adkar, Arba'een al-Nawawiyya, Riyadh al-Sadihin, Sharhahu ala Imam Muslim, Al-Mughni, an unbelievable human being. And Abu Hamad al-Ghazali, Rabbillah anhu, a reviver of the deen. These are the people that came and, and reunited and brought people back to his middle way. These are the Mujaddidun, the people that renewed the religion. Sheikh Uthman Danfodio in the 19th century. He renewed the religion in Africa. He was a man of, of, of deep spirituality, but a man of ilm, of, of fiqh, of understanding in the deen. Now, if you look in the Muslim world now, our tendency is to be, we're people of rage right now. We're full of ghabab, because there's injustice everywhere. People, I mean, Muslims are angry. Seriously, they're angry. You go spend some time in the Muslim world, and they're angry. And I lived in Algeria. Look at Algeria now. It's unbelievable. And this is from rage. It's from ghadab. And in many places, that's how the Muslims, they're just feeling this is too much. We can't take any more. How much more oppression? But Allah wants us to remind us, where's the source of it? Where is the source of it? Once you realize that the source, where did all this come from? All this masaib. Once we realize that, we move into the maqam of rahmah. You see? And that's why the rahmah sabaqat ghadabi. His rahmah is perceived his ghadab. You see? And this is what the Muslims need to revive in our deen again. That Allah sent the Prophet rahmatan lil'alameen as a mercy to all the world. You see, is he's a mercy to the Jew. The Jew lived in the Muslim Ummah for centuries as a productive human being, wrote books, were doctors, were uh, professional people. Why? Because they were under the, the, the boundaries of the people of Himma. They were pr protected within the Sharia of Islam. The Christian was the same, even the Hindu and the Buddhist and all these people. You see, but the Muslim, this is our role is to establish equilibrium, to establish order. And this is what the, the Sirat al-Mustaqeem is about. It's the, it's the order, the equilibrium between the Ghadab, the Maghdubi alayhim, who, who uh, become the ultimate victims and everybody's wrong except them, or the Ba'aleen, who become just people that nothing matters, it doesn't really matter, uh, the world's full of oppression, and just the, this is what the Christian does. They want just to feed the hungry, not get to the source of oppression. Why are there hungry people? Why are there people starving in Somalia? 
I mean, don't send rice bags. Change the situation. I mean, this is, this is what Hubba makes you do. But if you're all mahabba and let's just feed them and send rice bags, you see. So this is uh, just a little uh, short uh, look at the means of Surah Al-Fatiha. And inshallah, I'm going to end there. Inshallah, Allah. Uh, forgive me if I said anything uh, incorrect. And just also the last time. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll take. Uh, if anybody has one question or maybe comment. we'll take from the sister. Maybe you can mention the sister. Have a All right, question and the sister. Question All right, one there. question from there, one or comment. I don't mind. Because if Brother Hamza has another commitment, so we have to go. We don't. Question doesn't. No, think about things. Oh, the halal milk? Halal milk, yeah. Maybe haram like that. Um, well, the, uh, hmm. the, the milk is, you know, uh, Imam, Imam Ahmad Radulam, who was asked about Juban of Rome, the Juban, the, the cheese of the people of Rome, because they make it with the khamira, with the uh, thing from the intestine of the animal, and uh, he said uh, that uh, their food was ta'amun hallun lakum, ta'amun ahl al-kitab hallun lakum. But Ahmad Zarruq, he said, دع ما يريبك إذا ما لا يريبك. That's a beautiful qaida in Islam. Leave what gives you doubt for what gives you certainty. But about the milk, um, there was some kosher milk that I saw. And so I called because it got me worried. I started thinking, uh, you know, if this kosher milk, that means the Jews aren't drinking this milk, then there might be a reason why we shouldn't drink it. And I called the dairy. And uh, the lady told me that, well, they just put that on there, you know. It's a Jewish dairy, and, and they put it on there, but they were going to have a rabbi come out and certify it. And I said, well, is the other milk not kosher? And she said, well, not really, but uh, we just put it on. So they're just using it to sell uh, business. Um, you know, so it's a little problematic for me. I mean, that needs some investigation about what exactly it is that uh, they're... You know, there's a principle in, in Hanafi fiqh called istihala, when, when, when uh, you know, if a dog falls into a salt, uh, yeah, it becomes the salt, right? And so, there's a lot of things like that. I mean, toothpaste and these type things, uh, people can become extremely neurotic um, if they begin to get into all these details. On the other hand, there's something called wara which is the scrupulousness of being concerned about this. The Prophet ﷺ, he was asked, uh, what is the best way to make our uh, dua mustajab? He said, tayyib ta'amik yustajib dua. That make your fu- food pure and your prayer will be answered. The Qushayri says that the Sahaba were more concerned about food than they were about praying at night. You know, it was a real major concern for them. In the Kitab al-Zuhd, the Ahmed ibn Hanbal, radiallahu anhu, he was asked the fatwa, was it permissible to eat honey from bees that were living in Dar al Harb? And, you know, it really wasn't a joke, or he wouldn't have mentioned it in his book. He took it seriously. His point was that there were people that really had wara, a fear of Allah, that he, they were concerned about everything that went into their mouth. And he said, naturally, that he didn't have a problem with that. But, uh, you know, I think we have to find out. For me, the problem with the meat and the milk in this country more than anything else is all of these things that they put into it. It's not tayyib, it's not pure. They put hormones, there's trace antibiotics in, in the milk in this country. Um, the, the cows are treated with. I mean, really, if you go to these huge dairies and see they, they're getting constant... Uh, infections of their udders, they're giving them antibiotics, they also give them growth hormones. Now they're starting to use these artificial hormones to increase the milk, even though they don't need increased production of milk. There's already an overproduction of milk. So then you ask, why would they want to give hormones that they know are going to increase the rate of udder infections, which means increasing the antibiotic? 
Well, the biggest people behind the lobby to get that um, growth hormone uh, uh, legalized was crack. You see, crack. And the reason is because they can wipe out a lot of competition because a lot of the smaller dairies, if once there's overproduction of milk, then milk price goes down and the smaller dairies can't compete and they go out of business and the big multinational corporations get bigger and bigger. So, you know, for me, that's the problem. In meat, there's hormones. Any, well, the Arabs here that moved to this country, their average Arab like 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, I mean, one of my surprises when I went on Hajj is I was towering above a lot of people. Like here, as an American, I'm small, you know, because I'm only about 5'8", 5'9". Americans, 6'2", six, 6'3". Six, they weren't always like that. They've just been putting these hormones, growth hormones, into the meat and things like that. So people here come here, they move here, the immigrant people come here, and their children come out 6'2", and then they're saying, oh, it must be good nutrition. The best nutritious food is from Palestine. <laughs> really, it's the most nutritious food in the world. You know, why are they growing up? Because they're eating all these hormones. Now, seriously, it's growth hormones. This has been proven, I and mean, there's a lot of books written on this. The same, when they introduced meat into the Philippines, they all grew. Japan, same thing. Japanese are small people by nature. Now they're all big giants because the Americans putting their uh, meat all over. In Europe, they don't allow uh, U.S. meat uh, imported in, in the common market because of growth hormones that they think are dangerous, that haven't been fully studied. They think it might be one of the causes of cancer. There was one researcher in Los Angeles that actually thought that the increased uh, homosexuality in this country was due to the estrogen hormones that they're putting in meat, you know. And Allahu Alam, I mean, to me, Allah says, لا تبديل لخلق الله. And that la is called لا النهي. It's a, it's a command, do not change the creation of Allah. I think all that manipulation is changing. I don't think that, you know, Muslims have a point where we stop. We're not anti-science, we're not anti-progress, all these, but we have a point where we say, whoa, wait a second, you know, let's, let's think about manipulating DNA. Let's think about taking out hormone, taking out DNA strands that cause bruising in tomatoes, right? That is thinking that we can perfect the creation of Allah, and Allah says, مَا تَرَى فِي خَلْقَ الرَّحْمَنِ مِنْ you won't see imperfection in the creation of Allah. You see? So, I mean, Muslims, a Muslim scientist, I don't believe, would have ever done any of those things. This is just uh, ignorant people playing God in their laboratories. And, and I, they're, we're going to suffer from it. They're already killer bees from making cross between African bee and Brazilian bee. There's microbes out there that they've developed from their own uh, overuse of antibiotics and things like that. So personally, uh, you know, I think we have to be very careful about the food in this country. And in the Quran in Surah Al-Kahf, when he commands him to go, uh, ask him to go get the food, he says to look to see which is the azka ba'ana, the purest of the food. And Qadr uh, al-Bakr ibn al-Arabi, he says it means pure in all things, the one that has no uh, haram and also the purest in content, things like that. So Muslims, should, we should be concerned about we, what we put in our body, you know. So I, but in terms of, you know, halal, and unfortunately I'll tell you, and, and this is not uh, riba. Uh, there was a brother in, uh, who was selling the, meat with, uh, the halal milk with very good intention. He got all of these, because uh, the people doing it in Los Angeles, he went and got all of these customers and then, and did a lot of work. And then the, the, whoever was selling the milk down, in, and I'm only saying this because I know this for a fact, the, the person who was selling the milk down in Los Angeles contacted the people that he had done all the work getting, and he said, let's cut him out of the picture, right? And, and so I'll give it to you cheaper price, you see? And to, yeah, so to me, that tells me that the man does not have a manna. And so maybe he says no additives. Allah Adam, I don't know. People, you know, I don't trust people like that. So I don't know. Uh huh. Just a quick question. When the, the, when people say that when the Christians say Salaamu Alaikum, the Muslims are supposed to say Wa Alaikum. This is the thing that 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 is the 
the, the, definitely by the con there's no disagreement that the women sat without any uh, barrier between them the Prophet Sallallahu put between them the chil the boy the young Subyan that's who he put between the women now uh, later it was introduced uh, the Mashrabiyat um, there were like uh, wooden type things uh, put between them and a lot of that has to do with people uh, not having adab you know looking at the women or something like that now in uh, Morocco still the women go to the masjid in the east uh, in India, Pakistan, place like that it's almost you know women just don't go to the masjid where I was in certain places they just don't go and in uh, Saudi Arabia, sometimes they're actually uh, prevent, they don't like them to go to the masjid. Now, the hadith says, لا تمنع أما الله من, من المساجد Do not forbid the maid servants of Allah to go to the masjid. Now, there's a tradition of Aisha, رضي الله عنه, says, if the Prophet was alive now, and it says in the Sahih, if the Prophet was alive today, then he would have forbade them. But really, that's, that's she was expressing mubalagha because the Prophet knew what was going to happen. You see, he, he doesn't, his hukum is not for some time and place. His hukum is till the end of time. And so women should not be for, forbidden to go to the masajid if they want to go to the masajid. That's a command from the Prophet, لا تمنعوا زنهي that don't prohibit the women from going to the masajid. Especially today because in those days men were knowledgeable, they went back and they taught their women. Now a lot of men don't know anything. And, and if, if they don't know anything and their women don't know anything, that's we're just going to stay in this wretched condition of ignorance. You know, so, uh, I mean, there's a lot of, people get into a lot of debates about these things, but, uh, well, I, I think, especially in America, to me, there's almost, a, it's at the degree of absurdity, because people going outside, if you want to look at the haram, you know, uh, you've got plenty to fill your eye with out there you know you don't need women walking around in baggy clothes uh you know to uh enjoy your view or something like that i mean something seriously wrong with uh you know somebody you know one of the means that they they love zina it's a disease in the heart that's their problem if that's your problem don't don't project it onto everybody else well in maliki fiqh which i study and i don't really I know a little bit of Chef and